As an executive coach and mentor, what I do for my clients is help them make massive progress on the things that matter to them. And a lot of the time that has to do with figuring out what their blockages are, figuring out what's holding them back, and to that we need to turn to psychology. And the problem with psychology is that there are literally hundreds of different schools that explain the human animal and our behavior in very different ways. And when you look at the results of the different psychological modalities, when you do um, experiments and you assess how well they work, they all work pretty much the same and not that well. Not that many people get better, and the people who get better don't get better that much. Today's guest decided to look for the bright spots, to look for cases, and every therapist, no matter what they do, has a couple of these at least, where someone made rapid, comprehensive transformation, almost like on a dime, like in a single session there was a transformation, and they didn't go back, they didn't relapse, they didn't have to work hard to maintain it, it was just like something was undone and redone. And he began studying these. And he and his partners collected hundreds of case studies and started looking for what they had in common. And about 30 years ago, patterns began emerging. And about 25 years ago, the neuroscience of transformational change was unlocked. And so that's what we're going to talk about in today's conversation with Dr. Bruce Ecker, the co-originator of Coherence Therapy and the author of Unlocking the Emotional Brain. This is amazing stuff. So without further ado, Dr. Bruce Ecker, welcome to the Plant Yourself podcast. I'm so happy to be here with you, Howie. Yeah. Yeah, we got, we got a lot to talk about. I have been studying with you for, uh, I think it's close to a, to a year now. Um, and so I'm, I'm really excited to, you know, to have, the, have a one-on-one -on -one without all those other, you know, pesky students and their needs and, <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, really, I've always enjoyed your in the group, you know, in the big group that you're in that meets every two weeks. Um, your, you know, I've noticed that your observations, like you've watched me do quite a few live sessions, as well as uh, together the group has watched uh, videos of, of sessions I've done and uh, other therapists. And uh, your questions and observations are very astute. I really enjoy the wow. penetrating and deep thinking quality of, uh, of how you respond to things. So I appreciate your being in the group. Wow. Well, well thank you. you know, as, yeah. uh, as a non-therapist, uh, you know, I feel like I, I you know, snuck into Hogwarts somehow, even though I don't know how to do magic. Um, you know more than you think you know then. Okay. <laughs> Which is good, you know. So, cool. So let's 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 um, let's talk about it. Um, you know what the the work that you have you and some collaborators um, have have brought into the world and have kind of named certain things and have have um, you know synthesized very disparate fields of of exploration to to put this together. To yeah. me, I have I have trouble talking about it with people because I can tell they think I'm a huckster because when I say this is what it is, this is what it can do, this is what I've seen, yeah. you know, it's it's like I'm I'm some you know Tony Robbins offshoot who went to half a seminar and now thinks he can cure the world, and so I'm actually <laughs> very careful about how I talk about it. But it is it is amazing stuff, and yeah. and you are one of the people at the forefront of of. Um, Kind of collating it and synthesizing it and um, and sharing it with the world. Well, yeah, uh, what you said rings true for me too. I really recognize in what you said my experience. Also, uh, we've had you know we've had to learn how to present, to write about, speak about, and teach this material to the therapy field. That's our main focus: uh, therapists, counselors, and coaches, of course, um, and. It seems too good to be true based on the existing baseline of knowledge in the psychotherapy and counseling and coaching field. It seems too good to be true. I know it does. And it's more definite. It's more definite knowledge of how deep change works than the therapy field dreamed 
is possible for a hundred years. And so if we present this full strength at an introductory level, it, it, it's, it, it's beyond credibility to many in the audience. And so we've had to learn how to present it to not encounter a kind of a backlash of uh, disbelief or, yeah, huckster, whatever. Yeah, it, it, it's a real problem. Um, and I think we've gotten the knack. So, you know, have at me and let's see how I do here. All right. Yeah, I was suddenly, like, this doesn't may not make sense to people at this point, but suddenly like the resistance could be the the, you know, the therapy industry's need to experience grief over what they've been doing for the past hundred years. That's in the mix. I think it is. Yeah. So let's. Um, I'd love to start with where you started out. Uh, maybe you know, uh, a a short biography of uh, of young Bruce and how you got to um, exploring this stuff. Well, I was born very young. Actually, I'm not sure how far back you want me to go here. Um, well, what, did you think you were going to be a psychologist when you were a kid? Did oh, no, happen? no, no. That really came quite late. Um, it was in my freshman year at, in college that I, I you know, I took a physics course. When I took physics in high school, I wasn't that interested in it. Uh, but when I took a physics course, I thought I would do some kind of applied math when I went to college. Uh, I've always loved figuring things out and arriving at clarity of how things work. And applied math seemed to embody that. But then I took a physics course and loved it. So I switched my major to physics and uh, fell in love with physics, majored in physics, and then uh, became a physicist. I... Uh, I was in I, I, I was in graduate school in physics at University of California Berkeley UCB, but the Vietnam War was raging and I was about to be drafted into the Vietnam War, so I found uh, a job doing physics research that got me. I, I lucked out. I found a, a draft deferred job in a company that was doing some of its own research for the defense department. So I got a deferral, even though the company agreed never to put me on a military project. Huh. So I, I just threaded the needle there and, and began working shoulder to shoulder with Ph.D. physicists, uh, which I wasn't yet. I had to drop out of grad school before that, before I got the degree. Uh, so I had a 14 year career doing physics research and uh, at first really enjoyed it. My love of physics was actually my yearning to see into uh, what is what reality, you know, what's, what's at the heart of existence. That was really my, my calling. At, at, at what level was, was this physics? Was it like, you know, dark matter, particle physics? Oh, no, no. I, I was, I was wanted to head for very fundamental physics or cosmology. Yeah. <clears throat> um, but I, I had to get a job and I worked at the, field that they needed help with, which was a very applied, uh, it, it was a, a various uses of very intense electron beams and the interaction of these electron beams with the gases they're shooting through and ionizing the gas and rather complex stuff and using big complicated apparatuses to do this. Hmm. So, you know, I, I learned a lot about how to how to do that kind of complicated work and working in a team with people. I learned a lot about that. Uh, so it was good stuff. But after several years, <clears throat> um, I started to feel like, you know, this doesn't really get to the heart of things. It's, you know, OK, it's puzzle solving, but it didn't satisfy my desire. So, uh, you know, after about five years, I began looking around. What what? What else could I do that more feels aligned? So it, it took me another, to, I, I was, I did that physics work for about 14 years before I transitioned over and went back to graduate school to learn psychotherapy. And uh, <clears throat> the, and I brought with me my, my physics mind. My, my, my systematic thinking, my need to define things clearly enough to make unambiguous sense, you know, 
and my ability to ponder complex systems, complex phenomena, and arrive at at clarity. And I brought all that to the psychotherapy field, and um, that's why you see our work has the you know the nature it has. And the colleagues uh, you know who joined me. Uh, similar, you know, are aligned with that sensibility. That's why we get together so well. So our work has this has this quality that wasn't so common previously in the therapy field. Mm. And, yeah, I mean, the other thing I think you you must have brought from physics is you don't do anything until you have a theoretical background to test against. Yeah. Right. Like I can't imagine you. You were shooting electrons willy nilly. Say we don't really understand this. Stuff. Like you had predictions. You had. That's right. You had Maxwell's equations, the, the fundamental laws of electromagnetic phenomena that we were using to rigorously analyze the behavior of these beams. Yeah, right. So, so why psychotherapy? Like, you know, it seems like if you're looking to get to the bottom of things, it seems like like people see it pretty bottomless. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, and endlessly complex, right? And, and messy. Um, well, like I said, my real quest was what's at the heart of reality? I, uh, I couldn't help it. That's what I was hungry for in, as a human being, um, uh, as well as having enough fun and eating good food, of course. Uh, uh, but I, I, by pursuing physics, I guess you could say I successfully ruled out the analytical line of approach to fathoming reality, right? And and I, I saw that it doesn't work. I actually sat and interviewed a number of very esteemed legendary physicists uh, when I was at uh, my my undergrad school, Cornell. I was in a room with Hans Bethe, one of the most important physicists of the 20th century. And I asked him, you know, questions about quantum theory and, you know, what do these equations tell us about what's real? And from him and from many other readings, it was clear. The equations tell us nothing. The equations are brilliant modeling that cranks out the right numbers. So, you know, somehow it's tracking what's real. But to this day, 100 years later, physicists are at a loss to know what quantum theory and quantum physics tells us about the nature of reality. There's many vying interpretations. So I knew that physics doesn't really go there. It looks like it does, and then it doesn't. It's endlessly mathematical modeling that leaves physicists scratching their heads about, well, what's this telling us about reality? So I switched to the subjective line of approach, consciousness our own mind as the only other avenue then. <laughs> and it and and started studying not just psychology, uh, but you know, the world's uh different systems of knowledge about uh how you get how how consciousness discovers its own true nature. Right? And like what? Like what were what were some of the? Oh, there's well, all there. the major, you know, familiar. There's 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 uh, different forms of Buddhism that address that. What the Buddha taught. There's different forms of uh, in in Hinduism, Advaita Vedanta, especially Hinduism has ancient, detailed writings about exactly that goes into great detail these are, these are thousands of years of of people really heading for that and so there's a lot of knowledge there that is not present in western societies um so i've studied a lot of that stuff <clears throat> and 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 so doing psychotherapy became a way to uh hang out fully in in the subjective zone and i've always regarded all of my therapy sessions as from a sort of there there's a there's a psychotherapy uh, a psychology journal article called the local clinical scientist huh. it's, it's a tradition within the psychotherapy world where you regard each of your sessions as your 
point of access, your laboratory, for understanding how the mind works. And, and uh, of course, you know, your, your main job is to really help your clients, of course. And I took that responsibility very seriously. But, but, but I looked at every session that way as um, learning how the mind works. And as well as trying to apply theories and systems of psychotherapy successfully. And now, now I guess the story gets to more closer relevance to what we're going to be talking about, which is uh, that in my early years after finishing grad school and beginning to you know see clients in in practice, it was clear that all the systems of therapy I'd learned in grad school were not terrifically efficient at creating decisive change, you know, liberating change for, for clients. Um, and then over the first few years, occasionally it happened, you know, occasionally a major breakthrough happened. And I was now working in close conjunction or in sort of a clinical partnership with Laurel Hulley. Um, who I then married, but that's a detail in this story, I guess. <laughs> but our, our clinical uh, collaboration is the main thing there. And, um, and you know, we, we found that, indeed, a, a decisive, liberating, lasting change happened very occasionally. And it was like a surprise when it did, like, whoa, what, what, what did we do that, that led to that? So literally, when we saw that it was possible, um, and of course, in graduate school, you know, you read a few, you read of a few cases of that kind. It, I'm not saying we discovered such a degree of change, but when we saw it occasionally happen accidentally, serendipitously in our own sessions, we, you know, caught fire with the spirit of, um, well, whenever it happened, we don't know why it happened, but whenever it, that happens, we're going to study it uh, as thoroughly as we can and try to see what made it happen. So we did that across different clients, different symptoms or problems for several years, trying to see if we could systematically learn what brings about that level of what we began calling transformational change, which means major symptom stops and never comes back. Yeah. I mean, my, my understanding of what you were doing then compared to the most of the rest of the field is that people like I think of psychotherapy, it's like the Yankees and the Red Sox. It's like, you know, you got Freud and Jung and, you know, sure. Reich and Adler and, and, every, and people like who they study with really, you know, Rogers that like this is my team and we have the right model. And what you were doing seemed very trans theoretical, like we're just looking at like what works as opposed to we know what we do works and it just doesn't yes. always work or people or the clients are resistant to it or. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. And we had learned, you know, a sizable number of different systems. And uh, yeah, that, that became the spirit of our approach. Like uh, w w I think we, we think of it as phenomenological, you know, which is pay attention to what's actually happening in the therapist, thoughts, feelings, body sensations, you know, actions, behaviors, moods. And, and again, using every session to learn how symptom production works and what is it that, that ends the, the happening of a particular problem pattern or symptom. Uh, uh, whatever the different theoretical camps say or however they describe it, with minimal theorizing, try to eliminate all preconception and just see what operates and what works. And yeah, so that was our approach. And by the early 1990s, this, this approach began in the like 1986-ish. And by the early 1990s, we felt we had nailed down what are the ingredients that bring about transformational change. And it wasn't anything that we had seen named in any of our studies of existing therapy systems. Um, 
maybe we missed something, you know, but we didn't see it. So we put together, um, once we identified the key ingredients in our own minds, we defined that as what we're trying to bring about from session one, literally from session one. How do we bring the client to that set of experiences? It was a particular set of subjective experiences that was always present leading up to a client describing this kind of breakthrough and, and transformation and change. So we just started figuring out how do we head for that from session one and our whole system of therapy, which we initially called depth oriented brief therapy, but then renamed coherence therapy several years later uh, is made up. It, it all grew from just uh, continuously learning how to uh, facilitate that set of experiences. And then in 2005, uh, I was searching for, uh, I was search. I began searching through neuroscience research literature uh, at the urging of, of one of my uh, younger uh, uh, mentees at the time. He was very interested in that. He got me interested in it. And I, began searching, we all did, the, he and one other mentee and I began searching. And uh, I was on vacation with uh, Laurel down in uh, San Luis Obispo, California, visiting Hearst Castle, which was a mind-blowing place. Um, and late one night in our hotel room, uh, I went back to the computer and looked through more neuroscience <laughs> research articles. And, uh, you know, went, went to bed, still on the search, and lying there in bed. Uh, somehow, my mind realized, wait a minute, one of those articles. One of those articles. I got up, went back, and found it, and that was it. That was the 2004 study uh, by a, an Argentinian group of uh, neuroscientists that was the first study to detect what experiences could, you know, these, these laboratory researchers are all about procedures, the external procedures. That's that they're, they're trained to just think and describe in terms of, but this study described the subjective experiences that have to be created to trigger this thing called memory reconsolidation, which I hadn't heard of before. It had only been discovered five years earlier. Yeah. Was this a, a study in humans or rodents? No, this was a study in crabs. Crabs. Turns <laughs> out that memory consolidation was discovered by evolution very early. So nematodes, which are tiny worms, have memory reconsolidation to revise. Well, here we go. Memory reconsolidation is the nervous systems. I don't know if a nematode has a brain. Usually I say brain at this point in the sentence, right? Um, but it's the, it's the nervous system or brain's built-in process for revising what it previously learned, right? Um, it, it gets a little hard for humans to imagine nematodes learning stuff and updating their knowledge. So I think we'll switch to humans very soon here. Um, but for example, you know, suppose you grow up with uh, a parent who gets triggered into rages and, 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 and inflicts a lot of suffering. Well, in growing up in that family, you learn a lot about how to stay safe and not trigger that stuff, or at least try to not trigger that stuff. In fact, for every specific form of suffering created, you learn a very specific avoidance tactic. You learn the existence of that suffering. You learn how it works, what triggers it. You learn what to do to try to keep it from happening to you. And you don't know you're learning any of that. So it's called implicit knowledge, right? And it's very specific and powerful because it's learned in the presence of emotion. Neuroscientists have shown separately, rigorously, that anything learned in the presence of what, while feeling strong emotion 
becomes extremely potent knowledge that will last a lifetime. Yeah, I have I have a weird example of that. Yeah, um, what? When um, before my wife and I were married, we were vacationing together, um, and I got the news. And she's uh, originally from South Africa, and her first language is Afrikaans. I got the news on the, on the phone that my father had died, and. I was, you know, collapsed on the bed crying and she called her mother and had a conversation in Afrikaans. And I remember the, Afri the Afrikaans, I, I didn't know the language, but I, I can, to this day, I can hear the complete sentences That's of a it. language that I did not speak as I was, you know, in, in the throes of grief. What an amazing example of that, Howie. That's really amazing. And just uh -huh. so shows the, the reality of that. Uh, some, sometimes that's called a flashbulb memory. Hmm. I have a flashbulb memory of the moments I heard that President John F. Kennedy had been shot. Hmm. I was walking along a corridor in my high school toward a, a, a left turn. You had to turn left a few feet ahead. So I'm walking toward that, and some other kids are coming around the corner toward me, and one of them says, the president's been shot. And what I heard, because this is not a possible thought, right? <laughs> right what right. I heard is the president has gone hunting. That's what wow. my mind did with that, because I had no place to put the actual words. Hmm. And I, it had to come in a few times for me to hear the words that he said. And I, rem I remember the scene. And I don't have a lot of vivid you know, memories like that from back then. Yeah, flashbulb memories. Um, so anything, yeah, anything learned in the presence of strong emotion, boy, sticks. That's how the brain's emotional learning system evolved for hundreds of millions of years. Right. And it seems like there's, some, there's something about this type, of, that type of learning about how to stay safe that the brain doesn't trust to consciousness because we're so complicated. We'll analyze it and we'll that's screw right. It up. Right. Well, first of all, yeah, there, and there's several dynamics for about that that keep it from being conscious knowledge. One of them is you don't know you're learning it at the time you're learning. The implicit learning system is amazingly effective and vast. And our conscious knowledge and our uh, is very, our capacity for conscious thinking and knowing and choosing is very limited. And the, the amount of stuff that living organisms need to know to survive is way beyond the conscious capacity. So we have this implicit learning system. You don't even know you're learning it. It's in there. Uh, and and it'll keep triggering uh, on cue as needed for the rest of your life. The, the, it, it's built to not fade out once it's learned on that level. And so, but memory reconsolidation is the brain's way to change even that stuff. And the therapy field and the whole psychology field didn't know the brain had such a mechanism until uh, essentially the year 2000. Um, the last few years of the 1900s, there were a few studies that finally gelled at 2000. And what do you know? There it is. There's this way the brain can take a very specific piece of that kind of emotional learning and literally unlock the physical encoding in the brain of that specific learning and allow new learning to rewire it and, and rewrite it such that it isn't there anymore in the same way. So you're not just overriding, like most of, psycho, most of the psychotherapy field operates through what we call counteractive learning or competitive learning. You learn the positive patterns you wish you had, you wish you lived by, and you set them up as well as you can. And the idea is to make that happen instead of the existing pattern. And you're over, you know, you're trying to override the existing pattern. And uh, it does it, not very effective. You know, relapses happen. And, it's, and it usually produces a degree of reduction of the problem pattern, but not a profound elimination. Uh, but this memory consolidation is a fundamentally different process down to the neural level that can truly eliminate the unwanted pattern. So what, what did psychotherapy think 
was the limits of what was possible so that, that, you know, I don't you know, the experiments, I don't know, on like, you know, rats or mice with, you know, with electric shocks where you could, you could in, introduce something, some competitive stimulus, but the original one would always be there and always yes. be triggerable. It's like, yes. like there's some, like there's some kind of like landmine in your psyche yes. and, and it has to be protected and you try to stay away from it. It, it, it's, it's, well, uh, late, let's see, 1989, the, you know, the, the, the procedure that we all know the name of for this is extinction, right? Starting with Pavlov in the 1920s, who did all kinds of different procedures uh, with animal learning and unlearning. And extinction you know, you train the dog to salivate when the dog hears the bell, because initially the bell is sounds and the food comes in immediately. So the dog knows, oh, the food's coming. But then after that pattern is set up with many repetitions, you ring the bell and you don't show any food, the dog salivates anyway, right? The dog has learned what the bell means. The dog has an expectation, a very specific expectation of what that bell means. And salivates. So extinction is you ring the bell with no food many, 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 many times. And you, you know, you think you're going to unlearn, you're going to drive the unlearning of that expectation. Well, guess what? Decades of research, all the way to the end of the 20th century, showed in hundreds and hundreds of studies, extinction never eliminates the, the original learning. It creates a new learning that the bell means nothing is going to happen. And both learnings are there and they compete. And you can get either one to dominate depending on how you manipulate the procedure. You can easily reactivate the original learning of expecting food to come and salivate. And so there, there's, there's the prototypical example of competitive or counteractive learning. Uh, where the original is still there. Um, memory, re and so for nearly 100 years, they did all these experiments without identifying what they finally identified in those last years of the 1900s and, and really uh, arrived at in the year 2000, that there is a different procedure than extinction that does fundamentally uh, update and revise the original target learning and can eliminate it. Now, I, I really feel I should say and emphasize memory reconsolidation. An analogy is helpful. Electricity. When electricity was discovered, right? Well, we all know electricity can take many, many different forms, myriad, unlimited forms. Electricity is not defined by my air conditioner. Um, um, electricity is not defined by an iron that you smooth food, uh, clothing with, uh, you can smooth food with it too. But I don't, <laughs> I don't recommend it. Uh, well, that was how we made the uh, toasted cheese in the dorm. Where did that come <laughs> from um, my electric stove. Yeah, electricity takes many forms. Memory reconsolidation can be facilitated to alter what's already there in memory in any different way. It can weaken it, strengthen it revise the details of what's expected, revise the response when the, when the trigger happens, or erase, or un, let's say unlearn. I shouldn't have said erase because it means crazy things to people. Uh, we learned the hard way by using that word initially. Uh, but it's unlearning. It's true unlearning that nullifies the original learning, right? So... Um, Maybe an example is good here. Um, yeah, uh, an example that I like to use is a fellow who had severe social anxiety. Um, he described it as like getting very tight when he's among people and like in a way that he can hardly think and can barely get himself to speak when he's among people. Um, and it emerged that he he learned this he learned the expectation and he and and when he first in his first session he had he was clueless about that 
He didn't even know he had negative expectations of other people. That's how fully implicit or non-conscious this learning was. Um, uh, but we did our, I did, I did our process with him, uh, and he became regularly aware that he expects uh, people to respond to him the way his father did thousands of times throughout his childhood, right? The classic thing, a little mistake by a little boy, perfectly normal mistake. Father triggers into bellowing rage in front of friends or family members visiting. How can you be so stupid? What's wrong? You know, just, just tears him down, shames him brutally. Uh, and this happened so many times. So he knows that the slightest thing that is a misstep, an error, a, 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 a blunder, and, and others are going to do that to him again. And so there we have the generalization that the, that the emotional learning system does. When we're little, we, we don't realize we're assuming that our parents are representative samples of human beings. And we grow up expecting other people, all other people often, to respond the same ways our parents did to us. Not always, but it's very common. So he was, without realizing and expecting that others will, you know, shame and, and humiliate him and scream at him the way his father did. So he was tightening up and, and the tightening up really had the protective function of keeping him from risking saying anything. Because that's where the danger is. You could say something or I could say something wrong. And we use this process to have him unlearn the generalization. Or I, I used it. I was the therapist. Because that generalization was the specific learning that was generating his social anxiety and, and freezing up in his body um, in the present. So can I, can I pause here for a second? Because I think yeah, I'm, I'm imagining what people are thinking who are familiar with psychology or they've watched, you know, movies about <laughs> with people getting therapy is that the person would you would just you would say, ah, you would explain to him what you just said to me. You generalized your your everyone in the world is not like your parent, not like your father. And therefore, you don't have to be afraid. And he would go, oh, oh wow, doc, you're right. That's amazing. And he would be cured. But we do that all the time to people. We, you know, it's it's our instinct to explain to people why they're thinking wrong, what they should be thinking instead. That's the I think the basis of much of cognitive behavioral therapies and rational emotive, all that stuff is like if people just understood and we explain to them and then they can own their, um, you know, dysfunctional thoughts and just replace them, then they'll be better. And this is kind of the opposite of what you're talking about. Well, in, yeah, in the sense that uh, conceptual understanding, intellectual understanding, turns out to be just another counteractive, competitive piece of new learning that doesn't have the potency to change the existing emotional learning, which is not in the intellect. It's not in the upper cerebral cortex. It's in different brain regions and in the body, right, that that evolved to do emotional learning. Doesn't It's amazing to me, it still is, that these implicit emotional learnings do not exist in words or concepts at all. And yet they are completely specific, right? Uh, a dog doesn't have words and concepts, right? I mean, they may learn what we teach them. But, you know, when a dog learns that, uh, what? What's a good emotional learning of a dog? That snakes, so suppose a dog got bitten by a snake at a, at, you know, at a, at a certain age. That dog is not going to forget that snakes are dangerous, mm -hmm. right? That's an emotional learning. It involves perception. It involves the pain of the bite. Say the dog got bitten. And it might get generalized to garden hoses. Yes, absolutely. So these are very specific learnings that don't need concepts or words at all to exist. So 
right. If I had just explained the, the way you describe will to my client, it wouldn't have had any effect. And in, in, in fact, it has negative effects because it doesn't work. But the client thinks it's supposed to work because a wise therapist explained it as if the therapist thinks this should uh, make the pattern stop happening. So then the client feels like a failure because it doesn't work. So it's it's what's called iatrogenic, where the cure does harm. Mm. The treatment does harm. Um, so no, we never approach therapy by relying on rational understanding to make the existing patterns to stop happening. Uh, no, it, it has to be experiential. It has to be the creation of the experiences, like I said when we began talking. Mm -hmm. The experiences that do the memory reconsolidation process in the form that does unlearning. This is a very special subset of how memory reconsolidation works. It's the maximally effective version of memory reconsolidation that focuses on a particular target emotional learning and and brings about these experiences that that unlearn and nullify that learning. And the way I, should, should I go ahead and say how I did it with him? To, yeah, to get, yeah, uh, I think that'd be a, 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 a practical. Yeah, yeah, let's yeah. see. I'll try and do it as succinctly as I can to just get the gist of this uh, described. Once we had learned, now, so the discovery phase comes first, and and that's that's actually not memory consolidation yet. That's the first phase of coherence therapy is find and reveal and experience the emotional learning that is underlying and driving the problem pattern as the client consciously see, you know, experiences it. For him, it was this tightness, right? This experience, can't talk. Vast range, you know, people describe depressed mood, people de describe compulsive eating, uh, you name it, right? Anxiety, panic attacks, vast range of presenting patterns that people want to get free of when they come for therapy. So the first phase of coherence therapy is to uh, work efficiently and experientially to bring the client into awareness, where we're bringing awareness to the implicit learning that's outside of awareness initially. So that's driving the problem pattern. So I worked with him and in, I think it was in two sessions, had him now very directly in touch with what he suffered. You know, he, he knew his father had rage. That, that wasn't outside of awareness. A distinction we like to make in coherence therapy is the distinction between what was suffered and what was learned from what was suffered. What was learned from what was suffered is what's outside of awareness. Usually people have some awareness of what they suffered. Not always, but some, some clients, therapy clients, don't have initially even any awareness of what they suffered. So we have to start there to get to it. But he knew, uh, you know, he easily described what his father's behaviors were. And, uh, and that led to him also being aware of what he learned from what he suffered, which is if I do one thing wrong, either in words or action, that's the kind of response I'll get from others who see it. Yeah, and I've got to say, I, I, I love the discovery part the best. Um, yeah. Because I, you know, I, I took notes during one of one of the sessions, and I wrote. I don't know if anyone said the word, but I wrote it down like agentic, like be, <laughs> oh, yeah. or being. That you yeah. use that word, right? Yeah, oh but, yeah, we use that word in our writing and teaching. It, the discovery process arrives at the person experiencing that the in, that the problem pattern, which initially they think of in conventional terms as. Well, either bad, sick, stupid, or crazy, right? Um, and the therapy field has very pathologizing terms for the problem pattern. Um, uh, uh, maladaptive, pathogenic, dysfunctional, disorders. These are, Everything is named a disorder in the official therapy manual, the, the DSM, Diagnostic and Statistics Manual. 
Um, everything is a disorder. Every, the hundreds of disorders. The therapy field teaches people that they're broken. And they're not. Like my client discovered, when he got to this, he thought his freezing up meant something's broken, that he's patholo pathological. Um, and instead, he realizes that this was valid emotional learning. Makes total sense that he expects this from other people, given what he experienced and suffered as a boy. And that's why we call it coherence therapy. Because all these emotional learnings are coherent. They fully make sense and, in fact, are adaptive emotional learnings. He was freezing up, keeping himself from talking to avoid the suffering he learned will happen. Where's the pathology in that? I don't see any. And neither did he once he became aware of all that. So, indeed, the client recognizes that the what looked like a, a pathological, irrational pattern is fully cogent, fully coherent, and is the client's own agency in, in striving for safety or survival or justice or well-being. Just, yeah, agentive, ag agency is, is one of the key uh, results of the discovery phase. Yeah, and what, one of the metaphors I'd like to, I find helpful with clients is to say, imagine you're trying to navigate London, but you have a map of Paris. <laughs> like Right, right, right. If you, I think our way of, of trying to say that is you can't move from a position you don't have mm -hmm. or, or from a position you don't know you have. You can only move from the position you have if you know you have it, you know? So, yes, I fear all people intensely because they're ready to pounce on me like my father did. Once he owns that and knows that, now he's in the position, knowingly taking the position that he actually has, right? right. And, and uh, we're going to help him change that position by unlearning the, the expectation that every... See, as soon as I learn from him that that's what's operating, that specific expectation, which I didn't know. I, in, in coherence therapy, we, we always, when, when we train, we emphasize... You learn from the client what the operative emotional learning is that's maintaining the pattern. You're not going to try and figure it out and brilliantly diagnose it, right? Mm -hmm. Like a Viennese yeah. master. <laughs> uh, no, you're going to you're going to make it show up in the in the client, and you're going to learn it from the client, and then both the client and you know it accurately. And nobody's taking anybody's word for it. There's no theoretical thing happening it's 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 what's really there showing up yeah and well, as, as i look look back on my on transcripts of of sessions that i've done with clients i can see exactly how my brilliance is what gets in the way and i i, I like to put that word in uh, in quotation marks but it really does feel like oh i got it i'm i got there ahead of them or i see or this reminds me of this thing from the book and every single time it it either breaks rapport or yeah. it, cr it creates a thing where we're now doing we're now doing the wrong exercise you, you, or you, you push the client up into their head thinking about it with your yeah. idea instead of this whole body experiential knowing yeah yeah, yeah it's quicker that way they say oh yeah i got it now and they don't yeah it doesn't take, and, it doesn't know, take sometimes it. like sometimes like you said sometimes as, this, as the material is emerging, the client's describing things that are emerging into awareness, sometimes you do g g really get it before the client does, especially with a lot of experience. And I'm not talking about theorizing. You, you understand what the client is describing whoosh, more fully and accurately. The client's not there yet. And so it, uh, to do coherence therapy, to stay in the experiential process and help the client get it, requires the discipline of not suddenly trying to show the client how brilliantly you you got it and explain going into explaining it to the client no you got to stay with the same process of guiding the client to bring attention to it so okay so that's the first phase of finding the emotional learning that's maintaining the problem pattern 
Now comes memory reconsolidation because now is the second half guide the unlearning of that emotional learning. And that's what memory reconsolidation does. So what I did with this man uh, at, at the point where I understood that uh, expecting all other people to respond like that is is the target learning here. <clears throat> I simply said, hey, tell me something. Now, this is a Socratic question because I already know the answer, but I need, it, I need again, I need it to come out of him. Have you ever done anything wrong, made a mistake <clears throat> in front of somebody and they didn't respond like that at all. And they stayed relaxed and helpful and friendly. Now, I say it's a Socratic question because I knew the answer is yes. The guy is in his 40s. It had to have happened in his life. And sure enough, he hears the question. He, he looks into the middle distance for about 10 seconds. And sure enough, in in... His, his, his memory is responding to my question with, yeah. So a first example shows up. He says, yeah, yeah, yeah. I bought the wrong book. I bought the wrong book at the bookstore a few weeks ago. And I brought it back. And I, and I yeah, now that I, now that I look at it this way, I see that I was really tense bringing it to the clerk to, to, exchange it for the right book and and the clerk was totally relaxed and friendly like you said and and now i see that i i was surprised i guess i didn't notice that at the time so there it is we're on our way okay great great any others and boy a series came mm -hmm. all the way back to like in high school he misconstrued the instructions for the term paper and he handed in a term paper that was written on the wrong lines. And, and, and again, a big surprise. The teacher was kind and relaxed. I said, okay, I'll give you two more weeks. Can you write it? And, and things went fine. So a whole range of, of trivial and major instances of doing something wrong visibly and the other person responds mm -hmm. totally different from that. Now, this, these memories and this knowledge that people don't always respond that way was, was in him all along, right? Um, but it was held in memory areas quite separate from this emotional learning or schema, as we call it, according to which every human being is ready to rage and respond like that. All I'm doing is bringing the contradictory knowledge forward, and I'm going to have him hold them side by side. So that's what I did after he retrieved like five different memories of people responding calmly and friendly. I said, okay, so now let's review something. Now, before I ex describe this, I'm going to point out that the very first time, I'm, I'm pausing because I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make this very clear and, and succinct. <clears throat> yeah, here's a, here's a better way to do it. So, so I went forward with him by saying, good, now let's let's review what you've learned about making mistakes in your life that we've seen so far. And with dad, and I reviewed that, right? You, any, any misstep, anything that he thinks is wrong and you get blasted with scorching energy of rage and, and shaming words and humiliation in front of others. And it's just brutal ordeal. And you learn that that's what humans do in response to you making a mistake. So you're very tense around people. And yet, at the same time, we've also seen, and I review each of the five examples that he came up with. So 
he's not taking my word for anything here. And there's no theorizing, right? Now, the first one I named back in high school when you got the instructions wrong for the term paper and your teacher was so kind and helpful and helping you set things right. That's so different than what you expected based on Dan, right? Boom, right there. That is what the neuroscience researchers who study memory reconsolidation call prediction error. The target learning is encountering a, 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 a concrete experience according in which the target learning's prediction is 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 wrong and it's a direct strong perception that it's wrong it's not an idea it's experiential but i am calling his attention i am getting him to hold the 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 target learning the the problematic expectation in the same field of awareness of his own experience that it ain't so it's not true in that in that situation. That first prediction error, very rapidly, within a minute or two, is the brain signal to literally unlock the encoding of the target learning. That's a physical neurobiochemical change in the synapses and whatever else's encode these emotional learnings. We know it's synapses, but there may be other things. There's emerging knowledge about the brain cells that are not neurons, glia, astrocytes, all kinds of stuff is involved in the encoding of, of our memories. But whatever the encoding is made of is physically transformed into a different state that is now susceptible to being rewritten re-encoded according to new knowledge coming in right now. That's the memory reconsolidation process happening. And so I continued with all the, the, the all five of those contradictory knowledge experiences, reviewed them the same way, creating this side-by-side -side experience of the target knowledge and its contradictory knowledge, disconfirmation. And uh, we call that a juxtaposition experience. And that's what we're heading for all along, because that's what does the unlearning. And after I reviewed all five, I said, so how is that for you? How is that for you, Don? To be holding both. This seemed true, but now this is also true. And, and they're so different. How is that for you? And he said, it's 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 a surprise and it's a relief he said he was somewhat mystified these juxtaposition experiences initially are very strange experiences for the client because something that seemed like absolute the given reality of the world people rage at me and shame me when i do anything wrong that was just like uh, the water is to a fish that's just the way the world is Suddenly, it's not the way the world is. It's, it's a notion that I put together that I'm now seeing isn't the right notion. It was my notion of how all people are. So a very strange change of reality is happening in response to these juxtaposition experiences. Uh, but they, they result in the unlearning. The original learning no longer is sitting there the same way, triggerable. And indeed, for this man, he wound up... Now, some complications developed for him that we had to sort through for a few sessions, but it landed in him being able to be with people and not not tighten up and, and not lose his ability to think and speak. The complication was that he came back. He came back in the next session. I was so eager to hear his report. And he said, well, something's really different, but it's not, his phrase was, but it's not a walk in the park because if everybody's like my father, then my father was a normal parent. But if everybody's not like my father, my father was really cruel. And that's really upsetting to see. Mm. And so, so it has, so has to make room for grief. Oh, grief and, and, and anguish. And 
uh, let's see. There was some anger too. There was an anger process too. Naturally, naturally. It, yeah, it can get complicated right there. So we had to process all that. Took several sessions, and once the grief and anger was uh, were were you know, he was okay with it. Then he could really land in knowing that no, everybody is not like him. Mm. So a, a couple of um, just responses to the story. Um, one is it doesn't sound like he needs to be going twice a week for 25 years, given, no, so given six, this, this model. So, so eight, eight sessions. I think it was eight sessions. Totally. Right. Felt. And I said, look, you know, there might be other stuff from that, having that dad that could use the same kind of process. And he said, well, probably, but, you know, not now. I'm, I'm good. I'm good. He was, he, was, he was good. He never came back. Uh huh. And I'm a. Ima- I don't know if this does some of this generalize. Like if you do this process, and then you know, then his mother was a certain way that it might. He he might his brain might rewrite everything. Like is uh, I know you. I know you're a big fan of specificity. It doesn't. It doesn't work. Uh, I don't. I haven't seen that happen much. What generalizes beautifully is the client has learned that their mind is coherent and not broken or malfunctioning. Uh-huh. So they come back and, you know, people will say, okay, now I want to work on, you know, why I, why I procrastinate. Let's, let's do that again. Let's find, juxtapose me. Okay. You know, uh-huh. yeah. okay. But, but people aren't so good. Usually it, it's not a natural talent. I, I don't know if it's cultural or what. Look, uh, some people, uh, especially therapists who are my clients can learn to do the discovery work and find it themselves, but usually not. Even Carl Jung, the master psychotherapist Carl Jung, said, I, I can't analyze my own dreams. I can't really ferret out the full meaning of my own dreams. I need somebody to because you're you're subjectively in it, subjectively, right? And it makes it very hard to do. It's possible to self self administer the whole process, but not too likely to be fully effective. Gotcha. So I want to, I want to check with you the time because I I'm happy to keep going for several hours, but I know we we, we contracted for an hour here, so I want to make sure uh, that you're okay. Thanks. Yeah. For another few minutes. Yeah, I could do. I could go longer. Yeah, I lost track of the time completely. Um, I could I could go a little longer if you'd like. Maybe it would be better to switch over to your questions if you have any in mind, uh, rather than me following my nose the way I've been doing. Yeah, sure. I mean, wh- one thing, the other response to this to this story and my in, you know growing understanding of coherence therapy and memory consolidation and. Sometimes it's growing and sometimes it's shrinking. Because sometimes I'll ask you a question like, "Oh, I think you're summed it out," and you go, "No, no, no, not that, not that." So, so I'm very, I'm very happy to to sort of present theories here for you. And one is that, like, basically the brain exists to help us survive and reproduce. And so it makes there's there's a way in which this the conservative nature of learning makes sense, but also that there's this. Like you, like any learning, the it's better to know the right thing than the wrong thing. It's better to have knowledge that that is pertinent to the present, to the environment you're in, rather than a previous environment. Um, and so I'm curious, like why memory reconsolidation isn't like it doesn't happen more often, more spontaneously. Like why why do we why do we need a hundred years of you know of and and for you and your team to begin to put this all together. Yeah, yeah, that's a, I, I, I've wondered about that too. Well, my, my current thinking about that is I think we just have to look at what evolution set up and and infer from that 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 the existing setup is was the most survival positive. Hmm for conditions uh, on earth during evolution. In other words, that once an emotional learning forms, species survive better by sticking with it than by making it too easily changeable. 
So the degree of, of difficulty, look, memory reconsolidation does happen spontaneously. Uh, well, the unlearning does happen spontaneously in life sometimes. And I love the examples I come across sometimes of them, of that happening. My co-director, um, Sarah Bridges, in, in the, many of the trainings we've done together, has shared uh, how that happened for her. Um, and I, I'm sure she, I'm sure she'll be, she did, she's done it publicly. So I think it's okay for me to do it here. Uh, a learning from her childhood was that, uh, her, her, her father was quite harsh around any lateness, quite harsh. And when he's beginning to start to get triggered by lateness happening, where it looks like lateness is about to heat happen, he would start to jiggle his keys. He'd be holding his keys in his hand and he'd start to jiggle them. So she'd hear the tinkling of the keys jiggling. So for her, that was like the, the Pavlovian learning, right? The bell, that sound meant there's imminent danger of severe harshness exploding, right? Well, fast forward decades, and she and her husband are getting ready to leave, go out and do something. And she hears him jiggling his keys. She's, she's busy getting ready, and she hears his keys jiggling, and she gets very tense. And I, she, I, let's see how I'm not remembering the exact details, but this will be good enough. She said to him, what's the matter? It's okay. It's okay. You know, like, like I'll be right there. And, and he could see that she's sort of in an anxious, fearful uh, experience suddenly. He said, what, he said what, what, what's the matter? What's wrong? She says, what do you mean what's wrong? You, 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 you're, you're getting upset because I'm, I'm not on time. And he said, what, do, what are you talking about? I'm not upset at all. I'm, I'm just standing here waiting for you. I'm fine. I don't care if you're a little late. She, he said, you're jiggling your keys. And he, oh, yeah, I was. Yeah, it's just amusing to me while I'm waiting for you. And there it was. And that did it for her. Mm. She was so in touch with her learning and consciously and consciously in touch with this unmistakable contradictory knowledge. And that undid her generalization of that to other people. Um, and I think it's a lovely example of how it happens ordinarily in the course of, of life. The brain is always ready to unlearn these things that have been potently re-triggering for decades and would go to the end mm. unless the right combination of experiences happen. Yeah. And what's, co what's coming up for me is like the, the unknown grace of how many times in my life have I been a disconfirmation for somebody that I'll never know about? Oh, that's right. That's right. right? Like the high school teacher or the, or the clerk at the bookstore Right. Like, like the, like the, I'm just, I'm just struck by the amazing, like, I want to do such good in the world and I want to achieve and have scale yes. and, and like these little, like it's the little moments, like who knows what the, what the cascading That's effects right. can be. That's it's right. Being decent. It reminds me of that movie. It's a wonderful life. What you just said. Mm. Right. Cause that's what that movie's all about. That, that man is, is led to see all the, all the, all the good that he's done in other people's lives without any realization, any awareness of it. And uh, yeah, I think that is happening a lot, especially for you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I mean it. I'm sure you, I'm sure it just pours off of you. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Cause well, you, and, yeah. And where, and where it doesn't, there's a good reason. <laughs> that's right. That's right. The brain is very evolution set up this emotional learning and memory system including its memory reconsolidation capacity to, like you said, yes, be very conservative because the emotional learnings are probably survival necessary or survival positive. So only if the disconfirmation leaves no wiggle room, 
the brain has to see, boy, there's no wiggle room. I got it wrong the first time. Now, my client that I described earlier here, he had all five of those contradictory knowledge experiences happen, right? But none of them happened while he was also conscious of expecting everyone to be like Dan. So there were no juxtaposition experiences in those five instances. The only when I led him to retrieve all those five alongside the conscious expectation that people are going to respond like that, did the unlearning happen? So that's part of the brain's conservatism about preserving emotional learnings once they're formed. Uh, life, life brings these contradictory, not well, though they aren't functioning as contradictory knowledge. Life brings these experiences that could function as disconfirmation of negative learnings we're carrying. But they don't function that way because the juxtaposition doesn't happen. The target, the, these negative learnings we carry are in separate memory networks from these experiences that could do the job. But that's why we, um, one of the main techniques, we have many different techniques for finding the contradictory knowledge once the discovery process is done. And one of them is past opposite experiences like I did with that fellow. But there are other ways to find it too. Right. And speaking of other ways, one of the things I really appreciate about you and your work is how trans theoretical it is yeah. that, you know, you and, um, and some colleagues have, have created coherence therapy, which is directly mapping a process that based on memory or consolidation, but in the, in the, the, the re most recent edition, I think the second edition of your book, unlocking the emotional brain, you've got chapter after chapter after chapter about other systems of psychotherapy. There it is. For those who are watching the video, beautiful green and yellow um, paperback title. Yeah. That, you know, there's internal family systems. There's AEDP. There's yeah. EMDR. EMDR. Experiencing. We even have a, a detailed case of psychedelic assisted therapy with ayahuasca in that in part two that shows in detail that whenever any of these well, here it's eight different therapy systems, <clears throat> very different therapy systems. Whenever they achieve transformational change, you can find this specific set of experiences was facilitated just before the markers of transformational change start to show up. So, yes, we're very deliberately working to show the therapy field that there's this core process that can be facilitated in many different ways by many different therapy systems. And each system has its own theoretical framework, right? For describing how it happens and how to, and, and its own methodology and techniques for how to do it. But when you recognize this core non-theoretical process, when you, when you understand that core experiential process, it, it, there, some therapists have said to us, now I feel like I have x-ray vision because I can see through the theory and the specific techniques of any particular system. And I can see when that system is accomplishing this same core process to achieve transformational change. And that's exactly what part two of the book is designed to uh, show in a, in a convincing way. Yeah. Yeah, just got a couple more questions. Um, one is, I'm curious whether you have found memory reconsolidation in like, you know, Advaita Vedanta, like in any of these ancient texts, did they, did they have, you know, the, the, the same way, like all, you know, ancient Chinese texts sometimes have physics insights that it's taken us to get to quantum physics. Like, was, was this wisdom known at some level? Oh boy! Uh, you know, this is a, a a topic I'm very interested in, and to give you an answer briefly enough is that's why I sighed. I, it's, 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 here's I'll, I'll try. The answer is yes. It's not the detailed procedure of memory reconsolidation, to my knowledge, uh, that I that I ever came across in those 
Eastern spiritual, mystical, whatever metaphysical uh, tr uh, knowledge traditions. What I came across is something that I felt I have seen in my psychotherapy work, which is that um, it's the idea of Maya illusion, mm. that the, the world is illusion and that the source of the illusion is one's own being, one's own consciousness. And that consciousness can wake up and get free of the illusion and, and, and see it as illusion and know its own true nature. That's really the core, I think, message of most of these traditions. Um, yes. What happens in coherence therapy and, and, and any transformational change produced by any system of therapy is that, and when you and I were talking about agency earlier, we were getting very close to this, what I'm about to say. <clears throat> yeah, the client, the person has the direct experience. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we actually said this earlier in, our, in this interview. They have the direct experience that what seem to be and what they were taking to be the world the given world as it is was actually an invention of their own mind any specific emotional learning that is driving a problem pattern initially seems to the client to be the nature of the world as if it's objectively the truth of the world and as a result of this process, the client awakens to the direct experience that that was a fabrication, a, a, a construction, an invention, a construing of their own mind that they have now seen was only a construing of their own mind. And they have seen that it's false. And as soon as they experience the falseness, their own mind decommissions that version of reality. Poof. Hmm. One of the ways we check for success is to guide the client to try to have the same original experience. And I think you may have seen some, some of my videos of, of real sessions where I do that. I guide the, I, like, let's go back. You know, your, 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 your mother just, you know, exploded with rage or, or went into a panic attack and blah, blah, blah. Try and have the same experience. And the client tries to revisit having the panic attack, having the fear, having the shame, and instead bursts into gleeful laughter. That's one of the, it's not always gleeful laughter, but it's often. At, at the absurdity of, of seeing it that way now. Hmm. It's a gleeful laughter of joy of being free of it. And it's a gleeful laughter at the absurdity of having seen it that way. There's no realness left to that original view that seemed, you know, grimly real, direly real uh, when we started. So there is an experience that I have recognized in these Eastern, usually, teachings about reality and consciousness. Um, that what we take as real is an illusion and we can wake up and see the illusion and get free of it. Mm. And that that's, we ourselves are the author of the illusion. Mm. That's, that's so funny because when I, um, I celebrated the arrival of your book and here in Spain, it's hard to get books sometimes. They can take weeks and it arrived. And I, to celebrate, I went to the store and I bought um, four highlighters. Mm. <laughs> it, it only because it only came I only wanted yellow but it came in a four pack so I decided I needed to use the other three colors so yellow is just things to remember you know pink was questions orange was things I wanted to look up like references that I wanted to go follow up but I had green and I didn't have anything to do with green and then so I, they had a line and I don't have it in front of me right now um, but something like how the, the mind is actually casting a spell yeah it was near the beginning, and that one was green, yes. Because because th that was kind of like there's so much 
that I understand about that that I don't yet understand that I understand. Yeah, yeah, it keeps emerging. For me too, it keeps emerging. It's wonderful. Yeah. Yes, the spell, Maya. Oh, the George Harrison uh, lyric, beware of Maya in one of his songs. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, yeah, we're all deep in these spells and um, we can dispel them and get free of them. Yeah. 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 I mean, the other thing I'm thinking about is when I look at sort of ancient texts what, from wherever, it was, they were all sort of these all these ritualistic systems were all communal based. And you're talking about it's very hard for people to have spontaneous, you know, juxtapositions and memory reconsolidation that it happens in in relationship or or in community. Well, no, not necessarily. I mean, you probably usually. But no, people have juxtapositions. There are learnings that are existential, that aren't about human relationships. There are learnings about uh, how illness can happen and deprive you of things you thought you were going to be doing, for example. That's an existential learning. Uh, and, and people have spontaneous disconfirmations of their existential learnings. Walking along a trail, boom, either something happens you know, or or you just have certain thoughts that never were in the same field of awareness. And you realize, wait a minute. That's not what I thought it was. Uh, yeah. Would, would, would Christianity call that grace? Oh, I... <laughs> there are so many different forms of Christianity that yeah. call things different things. I don't know. Uh, maybe. I've never come across that. Mm hmm but conceivably, yeah. conceivably, yes, it's a it's it's a becoming free at a at a deep level. So yeah, I can imagine somebody calling it. I wouldn't call it grace. Right. I think other things are grace. Okay, but um, this is personal, you know, meaning yeah. semantic. Yeah. Well, last question. One one of the books you've um, co-written and published recently is called the Listening Book. And it's a book not necessarily for therapists. And there, and I feel like it's going to arise. How to create a world of rich connections and surprising growth by actually hearing each other. Um, it's a, a beautiful book. Thank you. And it's, it's really written in such a fun and accessible way. You have all these different dialogues. Yeah. And then, ouch, um, graphics to show where there was a disconnection. And yeah. it seems like, and, and overtly, you know, in, in one of the later chapters, you say you talk about memory reconsolidation at a uh, at a level that maybe a lay person could understand. And you say that maybe deep listening could bring this about. And I know I sort of asked this question a little bit in the group, but like, where do you see this work going? And my daughter, Yael, who's who you also know, who's, who's joined the group, asked me, you know, like, how can we bring this into education? Like, what if there was a school yes. that was memory reconsolidation informed? Like, where where do you want, the, you know, beyond therapists, like, where do you want this to go and where can it go? Great question. Yes. Please do it. Uh, we, we've had our hand. Yes, it, it, it needs to go into uh, uh, the political field, into all kinds of areas that would help dispel the spells that we're all, that human life is so afflicted with. Absolutely. We, uh, we haven't managed to do any of that yet, simply because the work of putting this into the therapy field has fully occupied us for over 20 years. Um, all that it takes to, to get this installed in the therapy field solidly enough for it to stay there and have its effects has been fully occupying. Uh, I haven't even ha had had enough bandwidth to start to map out how to get it into education and other fields. I think if you Google memory reconsolidation education, I think you'll see stuff. Hmm. I think there are people starting to do that. Um, but absolutely, it, it, it needs to happen. Yeah. Right. Awesome. I mean, hundreds more questions, but I feel, I feel like this is a good, 
this resting place for now. Good. Um, thank you so much for taking the time. I've been looking oh, forward gladly. to this, and I've just had a wonderful time gladly. talking this with you. This is my idea of having fun, so gladly. And I really appreciate your interest and your excellent questions and your uh, invitation. Thank you, Howie. All right. Well, so for folks who want to know more, um, there's a website for specifically for therapists or coaches or people who want to get trained. Can you share where where people can find out more about you? Yeah, yeah. Coherenceinstitute.org. Okay, great. And they can find the books there and yeah, everything. Yeah. yeah. One question is: is are the, as to your knowledge, are there live demos of coherent like? Uh, classic coherence sessions on YouTube? Oh, no, not on YouTube. Uh, on our website, uh, there there's quite a few different real sessions that are... Uh, there's one series of five different videos that's called the uh, Coherence Therapy uh, Training uh, Demonstration Series for that purpose. But no, we don't have real clients on YouTube. To okay. public, we yeah. want to try and limit it to only therapists and counselors and coaches. Yeah. Okay, because that's that's one of the things I'm doing with coaching clients, which the problems tend not to be as, you know, need, needing privacy sometimes, but also, yeah. Yeah. Like, I think it's really, it's really useful for people to be able to see the magic. Yes, the more the better. Absolutely. Yeah. What I do in uh, in the public videos is narrate cases like I did somewhat here mm -hmm. in our talk. Yeah. Gotcha. gotcha. Yeah. Well, so I, I feel and yeah, I'll agree is we are so fortunate to have found you and Tori and the and the team and are yeah. so great team. So thrilled to because uh, it's also I guess one, one final question like I, I know how this is beginning to change who I am just as a guy out there in the world and how, how I see the world. I'm curious what, like what your experience has been of like adopting a coherence mindset just in your life. Well, I assume that everybody's manifestation is coherent. So it helps me when people are difficult, difficult from my point of view, uh, <laughs> either, either in their personal behavior in relation to me or in the room or in, in politics. Uh, it does help me to assume, you know, there's a famous quotation of, I think it's Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. Uh, this won't be pr exactly exact, but close. <clears throat> If we knew the secret history of our worst enemies, it would disarm all hostility. Hmm. Right? Uh, in other words, people are the way they are as an expression of their adaptive emotional learnings, what they learned from what they suffered. And if we knew all that, it, it would, we'd have a more heartful response even to people who are very negative in our view in their effects so it, it doesn't mean it, it doesn't mean it's all fine it doesn't mean anything goes people who are doing harm need to be stopped somehow hmm. yeah I, I feel like there's but a just my the, the nature of my response and and the, the meaning of the world i'm in mm -hmm. is 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 according to coherence uh, so maybe that's as much as I know how to say about that in response. Is that a useful yeah. response? Yeah. I mean, when I, when I think about being coherent in, or, you know, adopting a coherent mindset when people are being difficult towards me, there's a part of my conditioning, and I think it's largely cultural, that says if I'm coherent, toward, if, I, if I see that, you know, if, if I disarm hostility, I'm going to be the victim. And yet there's there's a deeper knowing that I don't think I have fully, you know, juxtaposed says, that, you know, the more I see reality, the more effective I can be rather than less effective. I mean, but it's, it's, a, it's a pull. It's a. Oh, yeah. There's, there's, this, this gets subtle and requires discernments and delicate trade offs. I'm reminded of something I once read. 
about the samurai tradition in Japan, samurai warriors. Mm. You may know that it's very, very centrally important to a samurai, even in the midst of the most fierce battle response, to never run anger or rage. Mm. There must be no anger or rage that interferes with proper samurai skill and action. So see, there's a, there's an example that came to mind from what you just said. There's an example of being able to respond forcefully as needed without going into the kinds of meanings or reactions that the standard adversarial polarization sense-making would have us feel. Hmm. That's a lovely image to, because it's, it's so empowering. It's not. <laughs> it's empowering. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And, 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 and I think in some, in some ways it's um, contagious, right? Like the more yes. people we can get to see the world in terms of like, everything makes sense. And if we could, yes. if we can see it. You know, I mean, the amount of self-compassion I have for myself, as you, as you mentioned, from things that I have not dealt with, I have not fixed, but I'm like, oh, you know, there's, it's, it's doing a job. I don't know what the job is. I don't know why it's doing the job, but at least it doesn't spin me into anxiety. It doesn't, it doesn't you know, create a feedback loop that makes well, things so much worse. Right, right. That's it. That's it. Oh, just yesterday, something came up with someone. What was it? It was, oh, yes, if someone reacts to me with sudden annoyance or impatience or vexation, my old tendency would be to push back like, hey, cut it out or hey, don't talk to me like that. With a coherence mindset, my response is more likely to be, gosh, something, something I said really upset you. I see that. What, what is it? I, I don't know what upset you like this. Tell me what's got you so upset. Because I'm assuming coherence. I'm assuming the person's upsetness is somehow meaningful in their world of meaning and appropriate, even though I'm clueless about what it is. So I ask, hmm. help me understand what just got you so upset. Now we will directly come back into shared reality by pursuing that. Otherwise, we're just polarizing and having a, a bad, you know, adversarial encounter. Yeah. Well, I'm going to try that this week. <laughs> yeah, that's a very useful one. It's hard to remember in the quickness of the way these things happen. But yeah, it's, it's, it's good to try and get that installed. I, I like it a lot. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bruce. Thank you so much for this conversation, for taking the time and for everything you and the, and the folks you are working with have done for the world. I feel so much, so much more hope. It's just like, this is possible. Yes, it is. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Howie. Yeah. All right. Take yeah. care. Yeah. Bye-bye. And that's a wrap. You can find the show notes for today's episode at plantyourself.com slash 588. I highly recommend getting uh, Bruce's book. It is comprehensive and dense and it's written for therapists, but it's worth uh, working your way through. It's called Unlocking the Emotional Brain. Uh, also, if you're interested, look up uh, Dr. Tori Old. That's T-O-R-I-O-L-D-S. Um, she's a student and collaborator uh, of uh, Dr. Ecker. I found his work through her. I have a podcast interview with Tori Old. You can look that up. I don't have the number off the top of my head. Uh, she makes wonderful YouTube videos, sometimes short, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes that really dive into memory reconsolidation, coherence therapy, and other therapies and how they use the memory reconsolidation framework to accomplish the transformational change when it does occur. Um, so what's going on here? Um, I am gearing up for Burgos for the Grass Ultimate Tournament. Been doing a lot of beach sprinting, and hopefully the beach is, uh, you know, being so much harder. It's like uh, swinging a baseball bat with a heavy metal donut on it. That when you actually take the donut off, it feels light. So I'm hoping that running on grass will give me those gazelle-like leaps that will uh, give me speed and and help me have some stamina. 
Um, also, yesterday I started an experiment. I think I'm going to run it for 30 days and see how it goes. I watched a, a short TEDx talk by uh, Rolf Dobelli. It was recorded in 2011, uh, less than five minutes, and it was called Stop Watching the News. And I realized I've been spending a lot of time on my phone just in the morning, just sort of scrolling through stuff or, or having a laptop on my, uh, on my belly and then checking the news frequently throughout the day and realizing I'm getting very little, if anything, out of it other than anxiety. And so the, um, the goal is for the next 30 days to spend zero time on anything that is not good for me. And um, that what is good for me is a broad category. It includes doing good work, marketing the business, um, reading interesting things, whether fiction or nonfiction, um, playing sports, resting, napping, hanging out, eating good food, cooking good food. So it's not like it's any kind of austere monkish existence. It's just cutting out what I think was probably like an hour or an hour and a half of just sort of online scrolling, reading things. And it wasn't even so much social media, but news, New York Times, Washington Post, NPR, The Atlantic, uh, The Nation, uh, Foreign Affairs, The Hill, Al Jazeera, all the sources that I look at to understand what's happening in the world. Letting go of that for a month and seeing how that goes. So I'll, I'll let you know how the experiment continues. Yesterday, I think I took all of the time that I was spending, that I had been spending on the news, sleeping, which seems like a pretty good deal. I've been quite tired for a while. I'm not sure if I'm not sleeping well at night or just this move is catching up to me or if it's sort of, you know, the uh, cortisol cycles of anxiety that, uh, that come from being very aware of what's going on in the world today. But I'm, I'm, I'm doing this experiment for my health and for the well-being of myself and my family and my community. Let you know how it goes. All right, that's all for this week. As always, be well, my friends.